I started painting years ago. Here is my first and now my most recent painting. These are my three biggest things I changed my mind on. It's been a crazy time. Painting is the reason I was accepted to Cornell. The reason I started this channel, even though I pissed off a lot of people with noises in that first video. Amazing or something like that. But <clears throat> we painted a 20 foot mural in the lobby of my high school. And art is something that I haven't stopped thinking about since I made my first painting. But me being me, it's quite hard to change my mind. You're told to have a vision and also an open mind. And much like in painting, you're often juggling these two contradictory virtues. In order to grow as an artist, you must challenge your preconceptions if you hope to improve. So, with that being said, here are the three biggest things I changed my mind on so far. First one is Sergeant Mania. Everybody's heard of Sergeant, mainly his bravado and brushwork. This is commonly taught as the way to paint, and I'm not counting myself out of the problem here. Unfortunately, although his brushwork is beautiful and his work is immaculate, People often misunderstand the fundamentals of how he pulls off his work. Check out this video for a fuller explanation on this. But long story short, if you have to blast off to space just to squint and see your artwork, then your work is too damn brushy. The reason loose yet realistic painting is so popular is that it shouldn't work. Up close, it looks abstract, like a manic brush holding monkey went to town on your canvas. And once you back out, it looks hyper real. It's a good story. But like all heart-catching stories, reality is exaggerated to capture attention. In reality, when we are painting, the face and hands need to be worked in more than something like fabric or a background. Unfortunately, the internet, obsessed with Sargent, tries to mimic his work, but unfortunately misunderstands where to apply a loose technique and when not to. For a long time, I was also invested into this large scourge across the art world. And unfortunately, I realized that my paintings were getting worse. These first two that I did, I am quite pleased with. But unfortunately, as time went on, it felt like something was desperately wrong. I learned that Sargent did not leave paint on the canvas, that he actually was a person who blended quite a bit. But he was very specific about where he used his brushy brushwork versus more refined technique. If you're just getting into painting, I would highly suggest understanding fundamentally how Sargent pulls off his visual trick before trying to imitate him and failing to do so. The main tips that I would give is to learn what edges are and how you can create various edges using different brush techniques. For example, if you put your brush side to side and do it in more of a scrubbing motion, it will give off a softer edge. These are better for backgrounds, for soft transitions, across round forms and for textural objects that you might be painting. Whereas a more up and down stroke, a more soft put stroke is going to give you a harder edge. This is better for separating the subject from the background, showing off the hard edge of a more planular object or giving that little extra focus in your subject area that gives off a crispness to the final piece. It's important to understand that you can be brushy and that tight, too detailed paintings are our most natural instinct. But at the end of the day, there needs to be a balance. The second thing that I've changed is the drawing stage. This is also commonly taught in new age art schools, by which I mean the internet. If you ever heard of the term blocking in or general indications, or told the advice to just start slapping around paint silly before even staining your canvas, and then you just have to stand there soaked in linseed oil, feeling used while looking up your lease to see if paint on the carpet is financially covered because you just dropped your last 100 bucks on a shiny new sergeant book, then you have been graced by the mind virus that is this drawing advice. Originally, I heard the theory that you shouldn't even use charcoal and just go after your painting with a paintbrush. Putting in the masses is a dogmatic faith. To think that likeness will just appear in front of your eyes is lunacy. I noticed that although a landscape can be more forgiving as far as drawing inaccuracies, in portraiture especially, I was constantly moving things around and spending a lot of time fixing problems that could have been avoided if I had just spent more time on the drawing. I had been, I had been feeling frustrated for a while when I read this book by Solomon J. Solomon, a famous British painter. Here's what he had to say. Let me say it once. 
that I thoroughly disapprove of what is understood by the blocking in of the whole figure or object that is commonly practiced. The followers of this method begin by putting a series of hurried lines on the paper with the object of seizing the pose and suggesting the proportions of the model. Nothing could be more unsound, especially in the case of the beginner. Hurried and ill-considered, as they thus must be, is so great that we never entirely free ourselves from it. And the student who begins his work without due deliberation spends most of his time at the subsequent sittings in correcting the faults of the first hurried sketch. Now, I'm not saying to outline every highlight in the hair and eyes where practically most of it is covered up, but learning Riley rhythms, Loomis head construction, basic anatomy rules, and then putting down an accurate drawing as your first stage will make your final product much better and you'll get it much quicker with less frustration. By the way, this is a new format like video, so let me know if you enjoy it down below. I want feedback. Now the third one is the value of learning anatomy, construction, and memorizing a bunch of the nerdy art stuff. So you see in art generally that there are two camps, the shapes people and the everything is made out of tubes and boxes type people. This is more contentious battleground than Coke and Pepsi. And unfortunately, I here have to be a diplomatic moderate. Originally, I again studied sergeant like painters who were said to only use shapes when painting. This I found to be very useful after understanding, and I was able to make hundreds of drawings of paintings that generally looked good. But eventually, I found out that there was always something off. I wasn't able to idealize my subjects. And on top of that, no matter how much measurement I took from the subject, I still got things wrong about the human body. May that be the arms too long or the face where something didn't look quite right. And yes, I could have just remeasured. And technically, if all you use is shapes, you can get very close to perfect. But it's much more of a pick and shovel method where you approach a face like it's the first time you've measured or drawn a face before. I eventually learned that it's far more efficient to learn anatomical proportions like the face is split into thirds, where the ear is placed on the head, the size of the arms relation to the body, Riley rhythms, etc. And eventually I was drawing skulls like it was baked into my brain with a branding iron. I could still use shapes at this point, but then they were built on a scaffolding that stopped horrendous mistakes from ever being made. That all being said, it goes to show that there are endless approaches to learning how to make exceptional art. But at the end of the day, strict adherence to one philosophy or idea can really restrict the overall quality of your work. Check out some of my other videos here, and please go make something beautiful.